Well, hello, it's uh, Alec Hogg here. And as you can see on screen, David Shapiro, we are with you every Monday with our Business Premium subscribers to do our Rational Radio uh, webinar. Just by way of history, David and I have been working together, I was looking at it again today, for 23 years. David, I, I don't know if that's um, some kind of a record, but thank you for tolerating me for all this time and for uh, giving me so many heart palpitations by arriving two minutes before the <laughs> to start. But anyway, good, good to have you on. And I'm, I'm uh, you know, your fan club is, is coming in as they always do, share your, your views on the markets and elsewhere. Right now, there's uh, lots of confusion in South Africa. And today we're going to be talking a lot about the whole lockdown story. And in fact, we've got three lawyers, would you believe? Three lawyers to, uh, to, to take our pride of place today. Uh, we've, we're going to be talking in just a moment um, uh, to uh, Shane Kricher from Panda. And then we're going to talk to Rob Rose, who's uh, uh, also an LLB. And then uh, to Jan van Lochrenberg, who's also an LLB. So we've got all the lawyers to follow us, David. We better not, uh, uh, we better be sure that we are legally and specifically correct. And, uh, and of course, before we even get there, our man Stuart Lohman, who's our general manager, We'll just make sure that everybody can hear us, Stu. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. And always good to have you, Dave. Um, just those listening, can you please, if you can see Alec and David's face and hear my voice and then see a little presentation underneath, um, can you just give us a high five? There's an option on your control panel. Um, if I can see some of those high fives coming through. There we go. Got a couple. If there's any problems with the sound, please let us know. I know sometimes they are concerns a bit soft, but just ask us to bump it up if you need it, and we can do that on our side. And also, we like to keep them very conversational. Uh, there's a little questions tab on your control panel. If you put your question in there, Alec can pass it on to the relevant person. Um, but all good outside, Alec. Uh, good to go. Good night, I've got a code. When my dogs start barking at the door, I uh, disappear and he keeps jibber jabbering. But anyway, Charlie is here now. He's sitting in the sunshine, so all good. David, uh, markets, help us through. What's happening? We're holding. I, look, I, I'm talking from a global perspective. Markets are holding up very well. And a lot of the reason is that uh, more, more stimulus packages are expected in the US. And there's likely that the European one will be uh, passed either today or by the end of the week. You know, the, the Denmark, Austria, Netherlands and uh, uh, Sweden, uh, who are known as the frugal four, um, have actually conceded and uh, th there will be a package. It's quite a large package in terms of grants, something like I think 300 million euros, billion euros, and there'll be loans as well. So overall, markets are celebrating this. But there are other issues as well. I think more and more news is coming out about vaccines or cures. And, and broadly, the news is picking up, even at a slow pace, at least it's going in the right direction. So we can't complain about the levels of markets, whether it's at the pace that we used to or want to, you know, everybody wants uh, lightning speed recoveries. Nobody wants to get rich slowly. Everybody wants to get rich quickly. But I mean, this is at least it's a slow move in the right direction. Are you interested in any of the biotech stocks, Dave? Are you, have you found any, having spoken about vaccines, we often get these questions about uh, Magda's uh, 4IR fund, which has got an investment in the uh, Oxford uh, vaccine, but do you have any? We, I've gone for uh, one size fits all. I've gone for a Vanguard uh, ETF. It's the only time I buy an ETF, bought an ETF. I mean, offshore, simply because it gives you exposure to, um, you know, to biotech, to uh, medical technology, to the sciences, to big pharma. Uh, we've seen some big gains, and and another story that's coming through is the elective surgery. And we got this from Abbott's results and from uh, Johnson & Johnson, that people are going back to elective surgery. So a lot of the companies in the devices area are picking up as well. So it still remains quite a vibrant sector. But Moderna is, is up. Moderna, that's, you know, that's part of the, uh, the group that Oxford are connected to. I think they're up 380% this year, somewhere around there. I can't remember the exact number. I think they're out Zooming Zoom. It's, uh, I think they, they, they've done better than Zoom. You know, the three big ones this year have been Tesla, Zoom, and, uh, and Moderna. 
uh, AstraZeneca, who's going to be distributing the, uh, the, you know, the vaccine and is making provisions for distribution because you've got to put them in the vial. And uh, it's, it, there's a whole lot of science around that has also had a, a, an incredible run as well. So um, <laughs> when you do find news related to the vaccine, I think the markets are taking off. But I think the big thing is that it gives people confidence, you know, and that's that's the big driver. You know, people feel better about uh, that a cure will be, um, you know, will be found. So they tend to ignore the infection rates and focus on 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 that side of the market. So it is at the moment. It's 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 quite a big story. Dave, you can see on the screen we've got Moderna's uh, share price. My goodness, as you say, it's had a well, since COVID started in the U.S., started registering in February, you could have bought a donor for $19. Today, you'll have to pay, here we go, um, $5. Mm, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. <get> wrong. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, Lots of volumes as well. Yeah, it's been a big story. And and the news coming through is is you know, reasonably positive. I know that medical people tend to cover themselves and uh, uh, not want to get too excited, but I think I think they're one of many um, companies that are moving on, you know, in, in this area. So, yeah, you know, it's going to take a long time, but I think that as long as we know that something's happening, uh, markets will tend to, you know, to pick up. The place to have been quite clearly is uh, these, the graph that's on screen now, the NASDAQ. Uh, especially if you'd bought it around about there in mid-March at 7,000, you would have uh, picked up, what's that, hmm, 10,000, 7 to 10, over 50%, David, not bad going. The NASDAQ's up about, from the beginning of the year, we're up about, call it 15%, versus a flat S&P. You know, the S&P is a much broader measure of the uh, US market. So the NASDAQ has outperformed. Expect a little bit of underperformance or put it this way, I think, you know, a lot of the fangs and, and this has been driven by those fangs and now the, there's a new description because they add Microsoft in there as well. So it's the Facebook, Apple, uh, Netflix, Microsoft, wherever, you know, Google what, and, and uh, Alphabet, you know, it's, it's on the back of those stocks. So if we complain, uh, you know, we complain about the uh, the weight that NAS that uh, NASPERS and Process has in our index, which is around about 20, 25 percent. Well, the same thing's happening in the U.S. You know, those um, the big five stocks there have the same kind of weighting, if not greater, uh, on the, on the direction of the S&P 500. So you're finding a similar type situation, but. Uh, you might find those stocks just easing off a bit during the result season. They've run very hard, but I don't think it's really reason to abandon them yet, but expect a bit of underperformance um, in, in the months ahead. Isn't this a phenomenal graph, David, just a reinforcing? And by the way, as Business Premium subscribers, you've got access to all of this. Just go into the Wall Street Journal. You have to log into the Wall Street Journal from Business Premium once a month. Reason for that is quite simple. Uh, they don't want people to be buying or getting Wall Street Journal subscriptions on the cheap. And by go Jove, if you have a look at what it costs you to get your business premium versus a Wall Street Journal subscription, you'll see that our bulk buying power has certainly helped you out. But anyway, you can go, you've got to go into WSJ.com at least once a month from Biz News Premium to show that you're a bona fide South African who, uh, who, who does deal in a low currency that's why they help us out but uh, these graphs are just phenomenal every single company pretty much listed in the world you can get a data on it and here's exactly what david was talking about the blue line is the s p 500 index from the beginning of the year the black line is the nasdaq and you as you can see s p 500 is 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 flat david 0.019 percent whereas the nasdaq over there is up 22 percent so you know where you should have had your money but do you keep it there Yes, <laughs> I, I, it, it's going to go nowhere for, uh, it might go nowhere and there might be a little bit of catch up, but stay with the winners. You know, these are businesses, there's some misunderstanding, these are bus very, very powerful businesses that generate a large amount of cash as opposed to where we were in 2000 in the internet bubble. Uh, internet bubble. Yes, they might be, they're probably trading at a multiple, a PE ratio of 
of 30 versus uh, 20 where the the rest of the s p is but there's reason for that and i still think that um, you know in in the years ahead uh, in going into this data economy, going into the cloud economy, going into uh, businesses that are going to grow because of the advance of technology, they will still be um, the leaders. Um, don't expect, you know, don't expect it to be single directional. There's going to be ups and downs along the way, but don't lose your place. That's my second. That's their results were out last week, Alec. ASML. I'm not talking about this one, Dave, because I looked at it as a possibility. Yeah add into our portfolio into the business uh, portfolio and yo, when you when you see the way that it has performed it's very very hard to uh, to believe that it's going to continue along those lines uh, it, it, <laughs> you know, a year ago, it was just over two hundred dollars now it's nearly four hundred dollars but are you still confident Dave? Oh yeah, you must don't don't listen to me. Read the uh, you know read the numbers that came out last week, and uh, you know these are I don't know whether you call them Hollanders or Dutchmen. I, I don't know what the correct word is to refer to people who live in Holland without being offensive. But you know you've got dual leaders there, but very very confident about what they do. They make the kind of machines that uh, the chip makers need in order to produce semiconductors, and they're very confident about their technology. Technology. This is, uh, you remember Ian Cantor said, uh, was talking about it, this is a company which is at the forefront of, of technology. I mean, this is high, high science um, and um, a very well run business and they're selling these kind of machines that I can't explain because you need, I'm an accountant, you don't, in fact, we don't even need you know, lawyers, uh, the last pe people we need to actually try and explain this kind of business, but uh, you need an engineer or, or some kind of scientist, but it's a virtually a monopoly in the quality of the machines that they make and that's what you like, uh, big, big moat around this company. I've got a couple I want to throw at you, Dave, uh, which I'm really looking at very, very carefully for our portfolio. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to add them in. So, starting off with this one, to you, I've done my research on it. Uh, this okay. is a that I came across when it bought. Okay, just just by way of background, there are a, a couple of brothers in Cape Town. Um, Rob uh, Paddock is one of them who I interviewed last week. They had a company they built up called Get Smarter. Get Smarter was sold to this business, to you, um, to a couple of years ago. Uh, the two paddocks, by the way, got 1.8 billion rand. So uh, billionaires aren't just the, the guys that we feature on our webinars. They're also the guys that we interview from time to time, although you wouldn't say so if you looked at them. They have started off a new company, um, which is focusing uh, uh, learn or online learning for high schools. But in that interview, he said that two, you are doing really well. They're going great guns as they should have, because what has got to be the boom market in uh, the post COVID world, it has to be online education. And if you look at this graph, David, it's not like your ASML, which is just surging forward. This is an online education company uh, that you can get today at half the price that it was in 2018 when they bought Get Smarter. And if you read through their their investment call, they say that, they, first of all, they've, they've managed to raise about nearly $400 million. So they're pretty flush now at, at a interest rate of 2%, 10-year bond at 2%. And they've also, he was saying that in the last four weeks, literally the last four weeks, they have had more engagements and interactions with provosts, chancellors, etc., because they work with universities to bring them online uh, than they had in the previous 12 years. So here's one that I'd love you to have a look at and, and just, just put it my, uh, my project, if you would. It's a massive, it's a massive area and uh, we're not going to go backwards. Um, in other words, this kind of education, remote education, is only going to grow, even if we do find a vaccine, even because what we found is is how we can use it and how schools can use it, how it gives us access to the best brains, uh, either through webcasts or through whatever means. So I think that it's um, it's going to be a very, very big area. It's going to be a growth area. What I like about the big businesses, and I come back to them, is that those with money 
In other words, you know, call them the big five, the fangs, whatever you want to do. Those kind of businesses that have got the muscle and are generating cash are in a position to kind of buy these businesses once they get going. So um, it's another reason that I like to stay with the big ones. But of course, if you can find these, if you can use this as a theme, go for it, Alex. It's, I, I, I know you're going to discuss it, I believe, in the next uh, hour or so. But uh, remember, the one thing that we have to remember, it's not the rich people uh, you know, that we're concerned with. There are so many poor people in this world. And there's so many poor students or areas who can't afford this. And governments now have to make provision for this. Universities all education uh, institutions can't allow those that are stuck at home or those that can't get access to this kind of education, they can't allow them to fall behind. So I think we're going to see huge, huge, huge investment in this area. You know, I'm trying to summarize it into one quick soundbite, but it's uh, um, this, is, this is going to explode. Go have a look at this company. It's a global market leader uh, in, in its field. So it's number one in the world in its field. Uh, it's revenue, as you can see in the past five years, annual growth rate of 56%. David, that is a phenomenal net yeah. income one. Anyway, earnings 101. This is a this is a nice little one, and you, I would only ever have found out of it about it because of uh, the fact that it bought a company, a South African company called Get Smarter, um, which is doing great as well. Well, we're going to be talking um, now to the first of our guests for today, the first of our lawyers, uh, and Shane Cricker. Uh, joins us now. He's David. Do you know Shane at all from Worksman's in Cape Town? I know you know pretty much everybody. Have you? Have you been I, I, I know the Joburg crowd. I'm not sure of the, uh, the Cape <laughs> crowd. <laughs> Good to have you with us. And uh, you are a member of Panda. Now, That's Panda right. got into trouble this last week. David, now listen. Uh, oh, well, David does listen to it, but uh, we had we were reported to the press council by a professor Boule, uh, who is objecting to the fact that we published our on Burs News articles that you sent us. Well, to start off with, he said we took them off Twitter, which is nonsense. Um, the Panda people sent them, and in fact, I think specifically wrote them for us, uh, yeah. and then. Just elsewhere and then secondly he's saying that we should not be publishing anything from you guys because panda uh, have no legitimacy just just let's understand a little bit about this we did ask professor boule for to talk to us he says no he wants to go to the press council first by the way he says that that he doesn't want us even to be talking with you he says that we, we should not be publishing anything that you produce but who is panda so Pan is a group of concerned individuals, basically. Um, it started sort of right at the beginning, even before lockdown, um, where a couple of us had been communicating with each other about the risks that COVID-19 posed. And this paper came out on the Diamond Princess. I don't know if you remember, it was a cruise ship that had been uh, where there was an infection that was running rife on the cruise ship and they couldn't find any way to dock. And, to us, it seemed like that was the perfect petri dish um, for this virus to, to play itself out. And when we saw the results of what had happened on that boat, um, the couple of us who were talking said, OK, well, this isn't a problem then. You know, uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the people who were on the ship constantly being exposed to the virus had actually got it. Um, and, uh, you know, old people aside, that seemed to have a relatively muted effect. And so we sort of said, okay, well then everything's all right, let's carry on with our, with our, our days. And, um, and then we started talking about lockdown in South Africa and there were models being put out of, uh, the first one was 351,000 people in South Africa were gonna die. That, that at the time was more than the total number of people who had died in the world. And, and so we sort of put Panda together and said, look, what our first objective at that time was to say, there's a trade-off for every policy that you have. And it doesn't seem like anyone is talking about what the impact of lockdown is. So how can you say that lockdown is a good policy unless you understand what the effect of that policy is? Um, so, I mean, my, my job as the lawyer in the group was to try and keep everyone on side, which I seem to have um, partially not succeeded in, Alec. But, um, you know, we, we've got a, a, a lot of doctors. So we've got a couple of doctors who are in, um, in Panda. There's some actuaries some engineers, some specialist data scientists, 
uh, and then a bunch of people who are helping out on, on admin and running websites and everything. I mean, this is all stuff that's happening in our spare time. All of us have, have day jobs, of course. Um, so that's, that's who Panda is. And what's your agenda? We, we in, our, in the complaint to the press council, uh, Professor Boulay says that we are following your agenda or an agenda. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when, whenever an organization is criticized, um, you, should, you, you should see how, what they're being criticized for. So the, 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 bull, the, the complaint is about an article which raises a, a number of, of specific issues with what was said. For example, the, the rationale for the drop down in deaths in the Western Cape. You know, why, why is Professor Bull saying those things? We attack those. He doesn't respond to any of those. He starts saying, well, you, you're, you're not qualified, uh, you're mean, um, you know, the, these kinds of things. I think that, that is, that's perhaps the most interesting thing about this process um, is, is just this lack of focus on the substance uh, and, and focusing on, on, on other bits of how we say things rather than, than what we're saying. So, I mean, look, I, I think the tone, the tone is difficult to manage in these things because um, I, I think what's important to understand is that these models are right at the... At the, at the fulcrum of lockdown. So when, I, you know, I heard that David wasn't watching, but the other day I was watching the president, you know, I was sitting there watching the president and he's, he's telling me how with immediate effect, a whole bunch of my rights are, are gonna be removed. You know, that I can't, I'm gonna have a, a military enforced um, uh, lockdown. What is the, uh, from nine o'clock at night, I, I can't go out. A curfew. My family. Curfew, there we go. <laughs> Been a long day. Curfews, you know, there's going to be a military curfew, you can't visit your family, uh, a whole bunch of businesses can't ply their trade. All of these really draconian things are being enforced on us with immediate effect. And, you know, I mean, I grew up with stories of, of my great aunt Molly, who was locked up in lockdown in her house from time to time by the apartheid government. That was not something that I signed up for in 1994, that those rights could be removed arbitrarily hours before it happened. Um, and, and how is this being justified? There's a figure that's flashing across the bottom of the screen of 50,000 deaths, which is what our president is relying on. And, and if there are modelers who are participating in the creation of these inflated numbers, not numbers that are truthful, then they are right at the center of the lockdown being imposed and the lockdown being maintained. And so a lot of the scientists and data and analysts and people who work with Panda get very upset about that. And, and the, the idea that, that this article is the entire iceberg is also, you know, that this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of our engagement with the modelers and our, our attempts to get them to respond to us and to see some, and, and to, to give us some rational reasons for why they're there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it boiled up, but uh, I, I think that we're justified in saying that this is an important issue. This is... Uh, freedoms are being denied to South Africans that, that were hard fought for on the basis of these models and they need to be justified. Shane, we've got a, a number of questions and by the way, as Stuart said earlier, if you'd like to pose your questions, there's a little question mark uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel that you'll have on your screen. Just click on that and you can pose your question. It comes from Gavin Sergi who says, part of the annoyance from academics, i.e. Andrew Boulay with Panda, is that the scientific community have invited them to con join the consortium on modeling and they've re rejected joining the national consortium. They have tried to engage and Panda have turned their backs. I'm not aware of us being asked to. I mean, we, we participated in the, in the initial consortium, uh, in the initial uh, meeting um, with, with Professor Mkise. And at that meeting, we said, these are our concerns. And could somebody respond to them? I'm not aware of us being of any offer being made since then. I mean, the one the one interesting criticism we've had is, well, why don't you also model? Because you know, modeling is difficult, and and you if, if you don't put your own model out there um, and ex admit that it's difficult, then you shouldn't be saying anything at all. You know, I mean, I don't see any issue with with saying that, for example, a complex theory of gravity doesn't tie in with what I see when I throw a stone out the window. You know, if somebody comes along to me and says, this is what gravity is about, and I say, yeah, but every time I throw a stone out the window, it hits the ground. That's in fact effectively what Panda was saying. 
we were saying we understand your SEIR models and all of these things, but if we look at what's happening in all of the other countries who have been through this peak and down the other side, and we apply that data to South Africa, so taking into account the differences in our age, for example, just, just age, let's just look at age, um, then we can't see how you can justify a figure of anything more than about 10,000, give or, give or take 20%. Um, I don't see why the answer to that is, well, unless you go and develop an SEIR model, then, then you're wrong. You know, Michael Levitt, who's a, uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist, has a very similar way of going about this um, to, to what Panda has. Um, in fact, the same way of going about it to what Panda has. So why don't you just uh, take, take his model and, and refute it? Um, so yeah, I mean, no, we certainly haven't been invited to be part of the modeling discussion. We've been trying to get, uh, I mean, we've brought PIA application after PIA application to get access to those models. And certainly if we had been brought into the fold of the modeling consortium, we wouldn't have needed to do that. You know, it does sound a little strange. Uh, certainly every time I've spoken with your colleagues, uh, Peter Castleden or Nick Hudson, they've said they, they really just want to engage and they want to find out what the models are. Professor Michael Levitt, by the way, is a South African Nobel Prize winner, as you say, the only, our only living scientist. And we have interviewed him on Biz News uh, before. I was looking forward to interviewing him again, but he's now so famous and the rest of the world is chunking up so much of his time. He says he's doing no more interviews. Um, but he will talk to us again in, in due course. Uh, I look forward to that opportunity. Timothy Cornish uh, says, has anything changed in Panda modeling that predicts only 10,000 deaths? Yeah, so look, we didn't, we haven't predicted 10,000 deaths as, as such. We put out um, references to, to the models, so that the same kind of model that, um, that Levitt has suggested. But no, we haven't changed anything in in that forecast since it was first put out in May, I think. Interestingly, because the, the models that we're criticizing have moved from a figure of 351,000 down to, you know, some of them are 50, others are at sort of 25, 30,000. I mean, those are, those are significant moves. David Shapiro, just come back a minute because I'd love to, to get your view from a, an economic perspective or, or certainly from a, someone who's watching the, the real economy. If you start off with a pandemic that's going to have 350,000 deaths, then as a government or as someone who's making decisions, that's going to presumably shape you, uh, shape your, your, uh, your calls. Then if it goes down to 50,000, it'll also shape your calls again. If it's actually going to end up around 10,000, which Panda is suggesting, and certainly Shane is, is telling us now, then there'd be a very different approach, one would think. Hmm. I think I think at this stage we're probably positioned for 350,000 deaths. The way that we've closed down the economy and the way that we're carrying on, um, I, I, it, it's uh, you have no idea what's happened. Don't look at the stock market. The stock market is distorted. The stock market is forecasting what's happened uh, to process and last place what's happening in Europe, technology, what's also happening in the mining markets, which are reflecting uh, the Chinese economy not the local economy. If you go down to the local economy, um, it's appalling. And the number, the results that we're getting out are pointing in that way. And I don't see any change. If anything, I, I see things getting worse. So, um, and also anecdotally, if you walk around the malls or if you walk around, I went through to um, uh, Melrose Arch yesterday, it's death. This will not come back. You know, when I say it won't come back, the restaurants that are closed uh, will be down for a long time. The landlords who own those premises are going to be even harder hit. The businesses, uh, likewise, are going to find it very difficult. So we're positioned for a very, very poor situation. And if things were going to turn out differently, of course, um, I think confidence would return, and so we would see, you know, spending return. At the moment, I think people are holding on to their savings, very, very, whatever money they have got, very nervous to let go. So, uh, in my mind, we're positioned for a far worse, you know, um, far, far worse outcome than Panda are talking about. Thanks for, for giving us that, David. Um, the, uh, Shane, clearly, then, from what David is saying, we somehow need to restructure or rethink or reset uh, if this economy is not going to be completely decimated. The, the, the numbers that we saw from other researchers said that South Africa will lose 3 million jobs, which is already one of the highest unemployment 
rates in the world means um, we're going to get even worse. What what are you guys or how are you guys getting your message through? Look, I think that the first thing that we need to do is is to end this lockdown. You know, I think that's that's important. Um, the, the, there are there are a bunch of messages that we're trying to get through at the same time. I mean, I think we've shifted to trying trying to end this fear. I think that's an important part is to give people facts so that you don't have to be scared. You know, looking at the school closures, for example, which is an important part of opening up the economy. If people have nowhere to leave their kids, they can't go back to work, especially the poorer ones. Um, plus, there's an impact there on, on education. You know, they, what happens consistently in South Africa is that we widen this gap between rich and poor through these policies. So the, the rich kids are going to continue being educated by Zoom. The poor kids are not going to go to school. Um, in order to end that, we have to persuade people that it's safe to send your children to school. And so we're trying to get those facts out. Um, you know, I agree entirely that, uh, and, and Panda does definitely, you know, we, we said that the first 21 days, Days of lockdown would cause 30 times um, the, the number of life years to be lost that lockdown would cause. And that was right at the beginning. You know, that's significantly worse now. Um, and, and as I say, the first step there is to end the lockdown. I think the important thing longer term will be to make sure that this lockdown concept is taken off the table as a, as a tool that government uses when these things happen. Because for sure, there are more pandemics coming along. And actually, if you look at the Disaster Management Act, it was designed to deal with climate events. Uh, and for sure, those are coming as well. So I, I think it's important that, that that option is taken off the table for, for one reason and one reason alone, and that is that the lockdown itself has a massive impact. And you know, I think that this is an important part when it comes to, to, the, to academia as well, is that in the past, it was always good for the, the academics to put out big numbers. You know, When it was HIV, if government was given a number that was larger than what was actually going to happen. All it meant is that they went out and spent more money than they necessarily wanted to spend. But your, your, the net impact was a better healthcare system than government perhaps would have wanted. Um, it didn't have a negative impact. And so I'm not sure that that paradigm of being in a situation where a big number that you put out could actually cost lives is one that, that they've necessarily adapted to. And, and you know, I think that's long-term our, our, our goal. Shane, before we let you go, Dorian Wrigley has got a question. He says, could Panda please comment on whether their estimates include the excess mortality rates, i.e. it is believed that we are significantly undercapturing actual COVID infections and deaths? Um, there, there's a paper that we put out on our website on Saturday that answers the excess deaths question. So I think the best would be to go and read that. But, you know, uh, be careful about how some of the reporting is done. For example, in South Africa, our uh, our, um, our population register is kept by home affairs. So when, when somebody dies, a member of the family goes and reports the death either at home affairs or at SAPS, and ultimately whatever data is captured winds the works its way back to home affairs who then updates the register. If you can't go to those places because you're locked down, you can't report the death. So if you look at our at, at just diseases, uh, during the during the lockdown, our mortality dropped below what was expected. There were fewer people dying of diseases um, during lockdown. Now that's not possible. Of course, the people who had HIV didn't stop dying just because it was locked down. Um, what was happening is they weren't being they weren't able to report those deaths to Home Affairs, and Home Affairs wasn't able to record them. So what you must expect in that situation is that when you when you ease the lockdown, all of those people who died during the lockdown, those deaths are going to be reported and they're recorded at the time that they were reported. So suddenly you have a spike now uh, in, in excess deaths. Um, but in order to, to work that out, it, it is a much more complex calculation that, that will be required. If you do that, that uh, I mean, I, I agree that we're going to have excess deaths here, but the excess deaths are being caused by lockdown and the policies of lockdown, not by COVID-19. Um, of course, some of them will say, well, COVID-19 caused the lockdown, therefore um, those deaths are, are also COVID deaths. But I, I think, the, I think that's, that's not a correct analysis. You know, the lockdown wasn't a necessity. It was an option um, which was sold to us on the basis of preparing our, our healthcare system. Shane Cricker, a uh, director of Worksman's and a member of Panda. And Panda have got some pretty smart minds, as you've heard uh, from Shane today, who are um, having a different approach, a different uh, a different look 
at the system and surely goodness david shapiro that's what life for in a democracy is all about you should be asking questions you should be questioning those in authority those in power uh, on a continuous basis <laughs> you know we need like uh, when you watch this um, the battle of britain remember how you had a war room where you were able to see where the germans were coming were there We've got nothing like that. You know, we need a war. We need to know where the outbreaks are, where they were. We need some coordinated effort. Everything is just all over the place. So when you sit here in lockdown and you're listening to the news, you've got no picture of the, you know, you're not overall picture or helicopter view of where this virus is, where it's worse than, than others. You know, the news that comes out is so poor and the communication is even poorer. And I think that also leads to uh, misinformation, you know, which is being very poorly used. So I'm, I'm a great one. And it, funny enough, it's not only South Africa. I think it's globally as well. I think America's uh, need something like that as well. But uh, it would make such a difference to our lives if we were able to pinpoint where these bleak spots are and uh, you know where we can open up, where we can't open up, where it's better and so on. Um, Australia have done it pretty well, you know, where, where, with Melbourne. So I, I just wish we'd take a more scientific approach to the scientific meaning in the mathematical sense as well. Anyway. well lots of things are happening in uh, and being covered by the news media. Rob Rose is the editor of Financial Mail, who's a publication that's done particularly well. Rob, if you want to switch your camera and your and your um, microphone on. I see the mics on. Let's uh, see if we can actually see you. But uh, I was I, I was really, really impressed with the piece that you put out this morning uh, to your community, Rob, uh, talking about a judgment that we missed here at Biz News, came out on Friday, uh, which was 54 pages. So having read a few judgments recently, it must have taken you a while. But maybe just unpack the whole thing for us, because it is of critical uh, uh, interest to South Africans. Sure, Alec. Um, you can hear me fine, yeah? We can. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I looked at this in the context of, I suppose, a number of the of the lockdown judgments that have come out. I think Hans Fabricius's one on the killing of Collins Causa was, was certainly quite seminal in terms of what your, what your uh, speakers have mentioned so far. He talked, for example, he went a lot further beyond just the remit of what he was discussing to talk about the need for lockdowns to be rational, um, to be as light touch as possible and essentially provided a kind of a template for what government could do in a lockdown, which I don't think has been followed in, in this case. And certainly this, this Pottrell um, judgment that came on Friday, um, I think was in the same vein. It essentially talked about the fact that the education, basic education department has stopped feeding 9 million school children, uh, which they did under the school nutrition program. Um, and they were taken to court by Equal Education and a few others, a few school governing bodies. Um, and in this court, in this court case, it was quite some of the affidavits were, were quite arresting. I mean, they talked about the parents not being able to feed their kids. You know, the, the children themselves talked in some of the affidavits about how they was fighting at home over food. It was quite a quite an emotional thing. Um, and in the Rob, end, just, the judge ruled sorry, that for a minute because yeah. we can get into the judgment. Just just repeat that. Because it rolls off the tongue. Nine million children in South yeah, Africa. It's a staggering a amount. School feeding scheme, which government stopped. What was their rationale for doing that? Well, the rationale was that we had a lockdown, so people aren't going to school, so we stopped the school program. I mean, Alec, it actually goes beyond that. It's, it basically provides food for, for half of all the children in the country. A fifth of South Africa's total population relied on this feeding scheme. Um, it was a fundamental tenet of South Africa's ability to provide resources to people who don't have. So it went far beyond just schooling. So to just stop it blank like they did when the lockdown happened was was a staggering decision. But OK, so if there's a lockdown and people aren't going to school, was there an alternative way to get the food to the children? Is that what they argue? Yeah, well, well, no. I mean, the, the, government, the Western Cape government, for example, has found a way to has been giving food to children um, of various schools and they have, I suppose, gone above and beyond to find a way to actually feed the kids who relied on it. But the education department and human Chekha's department argued that they weren't really going to do this. They were only going to feed kids who went to school um, when they were meant to go back. For example, the matrix went back and so they were going to provide some meals, um, which wasn't good enough. By, I think it's June 22nd, 6 million of the 9 million kids weren't getting food. 
So that's a, that's a huge amount of, of people in this country, of families in this country that were had been badly let down by the government. It sounds it sounds almost too horrific to believe. But what did the judge find? What was her uh, ruling? Well, Alec, I mean, the interesting part is that is that the education department argued that essentially it's just a happy accident of the fact that they provide education that they also provide food. So they said it's not really a constitutional obligation to provide food to these children. Um, but the judge actually said, well, you do have an obligation to do it. Um, and you really have to provide this. And so they, they, she ruled essentially that they'd, that they'd breached their constitutional duty to feed children in this country. So they've now been ordered to, but it went a bit further than that actually. She ordered that the department be placed under, under judicial supervision. In other words, they're going to be monitored and ensured that they are doing what they're meant to do because the judge just doesn't trust what's coming out of that department. Um, she talked about the untruths in the in the court case that she heard from the edu education department. And, you know, it's, it's that's a really bad sign that, that the judge doesn't trust them to do what they say they're going to do. I, I, you know Warren Buffett and that wonderful saying of his that when the tide goes out, we can see who hasn't been swimming with trunks on. It certainly looks like this COVID-19 crisis and the lockdown that, that accompanied it has been exposing a lot of uh, issues in our system. And, and this is one that, that really goes to the, the core of, of what a, a, a caring government should be all about. Yeah, I mean, the judge, the judge put it nicely. I mean, essentially, she said that this is actually the essence of what a government should be doing. You know, it's, it's, it's not an issue of charity. And the morality of a society is gauged by how it treats its children. So I think this is not just it's a fundamental blow to how the ANC sees itself as helping people who are vulnerable um, and how the government has acted in the lockdown. If you're going to, you know, Paul Krugman's written a lot in the New York Times about how if you're going to put the economy on ice, you've got to make sure you you're able to support people through this. Um, they certainly haven't done that. I mean, the, the issues you've seen over the UIF and various other issues show they're not doing that, but they aren't even providing the basics to children to the most vulnerable so they're failing in, in a rather epic way um and it's you know school children the six million school children who weren't fed on june 22nd they're not going to be the ones who come and you know come to the media and talk about it but these are just people who are fundamentally being failed with no no representation in the media um and it's it's, it's quite depressing how did you describe it in your note today the headline? Um, uh, the headline was something about it essentially being the most the shameful moment of the lockdown. The most shameful moment. Certainly, of the certainly lockdown. shameful. I mean, I, I think that this this captures the essence of the failure. Um, I mean, you can talk about the murder of Collins Causa and the overreaches by the by the authorities. You can also talk about how they didn't consult people on the alcohol ban, for example. But I think failing to feed the kids, I mean, that that to me is the most is the most egregious um, failure. Rob Rose, thanks for joining us today. Rob is the editor of the Financial Mail, and uh, they've been doing amazing work during the COVID-19 crisis by highlighting areas that unfortunately uh, haven't been that popular to be highlighted elsewhere. And I think it's it's uh, one of those areas that he spoke about is the uh, final interview we are going to have on this edition of Rational Radio. And it's welcome to Johan van Lochrenberg, uh, who, if um, there he is well, on cue. Thank you, Johan. Good to see you. Um, who is is uh, pretty well known by Biz News community for the work that you've done uh, in shining the light into places where it uh, it well those who are in there don't necessarily want to see those lights shone. But you've been involved in a global uh, round table on illicit crime, Johan. First of all, how did you get the invitation to that? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Hello, Alec. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I suspect it was by chance because uh, it was a round table of experts. But um, it was it was certainly a, a privilege to be part of the process. Um, effectively, it consisted of a number of experts uh, throughout the world from different continents that uh, had a look at um, the illicit trade in, in the COVID era. 
what were the conclusions? And I think this is important for us to understand, Johan, because here in South Africa, we sometimes are somewhat isolated. We think that, uh, you know, why only us? But uh, particularly with what's going on with cigarettes and alcohol, and I'm sure you can apply your mind to that in a moment. But what were the major conclusions that were derived? Well, I think it, it might be useful to just reflect on what the purpose was. Uh, they, they really wanted to look at what the state was of the illicit trade during the COVID period and what the current drivers and conditions were that were favouring the illicit trade and then uh, looking towards coming up with recommendations on what ought to be done. Um, Sorry, you different from the, the two in your office tapping a, a, a screen, was it a, a keyboard? It's coming through because it's only you and I who've got our mics on. No keyboard. No keyboard, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm not typing at all. <laughs> oh, me neither. Okay. Uh, well, I should stop now. So that's good news. Okay. Um, the so, uh, yeah. So, uh, should I repeat that? Please. So the purpose was really to look at, um, uh, you know, uh, the 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 develop the, the the different factors within um, organised crime worldwide under the COVID period what were the key drivers and what ought to be done and they were looking towards um, coming up with uh, uh, recommendations in that respect. So um, common to all the different countries that, that had been looked at, which is effectively the entire world, was the conclusion that different from what we heard from some of your other speakers now of the doom and gloom um, and, and, and um, negativity within uh, the, the licit economy, there's certainly an increased uh, uh, number of illicit activities that have been experienced worldwide, and it's expected to continue growing. Um, and some of the, 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 the areas that have been highlighted um, of, of significant concern are things like human smuggling and trafficking, uh, the medicine and pharmaceutical industry, alcohol, alcohol um, this is now the alcohol that you consume, tobacco, obviously personal protection uh, equipment, home care products, uh, wildlife, uh, narcotics and cybercrime. And then they, there were some uh, um, examples, um, particularly around the rise in fake medical products related to uh, COVID-19. Uh, there was a, a number of 60 people that had been reported uh, to have passed away as a result of um, consuming tainted alcohol, which is not something uncommon to the South African experience, uh, in what, what's known as poisoned liquor. Um, there was a, a case study on, on how the mafia in Italy had capitalized on, on the COVID pandemic, both to uh, curry political favor and to take over businesses in distress. Um, and then, of course, the, the South African tobacco ban also featured. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately also, I mean, because of the volatility on the markets economically and the, the value of gold, um, that directly seems to have an impact on um, uh, the illicit mining sector, particularly around gold and, 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 and precious stones. Um, in, in terms of conclusions, really, they 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 came came to a consensus that what would be required would be an integrated, multi-sector, multilateral um, approach. Meaning, it should be government, private sector, and civil society that must uh, operate collectively. Uh, this is also the time to continue uh, to empower and educate consumers to increase awareness and and sense of responsibility, which is obviously made more difficult under lockdown regulations. Uh, they also concluded that um, perhaps governments ought to consider revising measures that would balance public health needs on the one end and the unintended consequences of restrictive policies, not only in respect of the economy per se, um, as we've heard from your other speakers, but in a, in a general sense, too, in relation to the government between the citizen, I mean, the relationship between citizenry and government, 
And then lastly, there was an acknowledgement that we don't really know enough. So we need a comprehensive analysis of what's going on in the in the world of organized crime. Um, and perhaps there's an opportunity to improve the international cooperation and 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 leverage of um, international instruments that have not yet fully matured or been used properly um, in, in some of the parts of the world. Oh, great stuff. Um, I'm I'm still hearing that tapping in the background, Stuart. I don't know if you're able to try and find out where it's coming from, um, but anyway, it stopped for the moment. Uh, Johan, bring it back to South Africa. Uh, and sure. when we last spoke, we were talking about the cigarette ban, which was bad enough, and the excise duties lost. In your old, in your former life, uh, I'm sure you'd have been tearing your hair out now, given. Uh, that uh, the, the SARS or the, 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 the fiscus is not getting uh, its due from cigarette sales, yet the feedback we get from cigarette smugglers and, and uh, or maybe the ex-cigarette smugglers is that the prices have gone up six, seven hundred percent. You can still get your smokes, you can still buy them, but we, there's only one uh, group that is profiting and that's the, the smugglers and the illicit uh, sector. Yes, Alec, I, I agree with that. I, I, I mean, I've been on record on a number of platforms on this. Uh, my estimation by month three was that I think around six billion rand had gone into the unrecorded economy. And as you know, that's uh, notoriously difficult to claw back and, um, and go and find. I think uh, some of it's left our shores, so that's going to be even more difficult to go and find. Um, the fact that people can still access cigarettes is so. Uh, in fact, the, you know, I, I made, gave the example that, that the South African um, uh, tobacco ban featured at this roundtable discussion for precisely that reason. You know, it was a, it, South Africa is the only country in the world that's banned the sale of tobacco. And we have around 7.5 million adult smokers. So you immediately cut off a supply like that and what's going to happen with the demand. The criminals and opportunists are going to leap onto that. And there's the fiscal argument of loss to um to 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 the revenue service and to you know to to the country in terms of taxes. But my concern is more the influx of uh foreign transnational um, organized crime syndicates and their newly formed liaisons and new uh, modus operandi and, and, and channels that they're setting up during this time of lockdown, and they're strengthening. And we're already moving off a very low base, thanks to the state capture gang with a weakened criminal justice system and revenue authority. So I don't think things are looking all that grand. That's that's very concerning. I, I I'm sure you recall uh, in 1994 when there when there was a change in um, in regimes, if you like, uh, where there were a lot of the old cops who were who were kicked out, and new cops came in, hadn't quite found their feet yet, and the criminal syndicates from around the world uh, made hay for a period of time until the new cops got their feet on the ground. But what uh, what I'm hearing from you is that it's almost a situation like that. You know, people forget. Post 94, 95, 96, 97, you didn't walk around the streets. Uh, we've only regained those streets fairly recently. Um, and we might be going back into that kind of an environment, uh, given what you're saying. Because if we're the only place in the world where cigarettes are banned, well, surely it's like a magnet to the, to the underworld. Yes, of course. I'm, I'm not sure, Alec, if I agree with you on. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the issue around 1994, you must remember we lived in a, in, a, in a country that deliberately shut itself off from the world. And as a consequence, the world shut itself off from, uh, you know, the, the apartheid regime. And uh, the, the, the manner in which our borders were managed was, was you know, more to prop up the regime than, than anything else. Um, Certainly when the borders started opening up in the early 90s, even before the elections, uh, we, we did become uh, you know, very attractive to transnational organized crime. And it took us a little while, it took us a couple of years to introduce um, 
systems, uh, you know, and, and, and we saw things like the Financial Intelligence Center coming about and the Asset Forfeiture Unit and the Special Investigations Unit. And there were those golden years of visible um, uh, successes against organized crime. And I think the Revenue Service played a key role too, certainly. Um, and as I said, you know, the State Capture Gang uh, really broke that down, that little bit, little bit of gain that we got. But the net effect for me is that if you're going to ban something, you must have something in place to, to deal with that ban, especially when you've got 7.5 million odd consumers who want that product and they want it today, and they're prepared to pay up to five, six times the value. They're not interested in where, it coming, where it's coming from anymore, so they're effectively all criminals. They're no different to you know a guy who goes and buys cocaine or a illegal firearm. They've all been criminalized now. Um, my worry is the money. My worry is the money and the fact that these gangs and, and transnational organized crimes are getting a foothold in the country that post ban, post lockdown is going to cause um, a big headache for this government. Johan, we know that uh, certainly from the many uh, medical practitioners and specialists that we've engaged with, that the alcohol ban has been widely celebrated in the hospitals because uh, South Africa has got a terrible drinking problem. And uh, if you stop South Africans drinking, they don't they don't kill each other quite as much as or, or um, commit the violence as much as they do otherwise. But that might also uh, play into the hands of organized crime, because I guess if people want booze, they're going to get it somewhere. Yes, I, I, look, um, I mean, I've, I've known organized crime my entire adult life. I started working in the organized crime intelligence unit in uh, late 1993, um, and, and I moved among them. So in that period that you spoke of, I saw the, you know, the, the growth of organized crime and how it matured over the years. And later at my time at the Revenue Service, I again, you know, uh, dealt with some pretty um, big um, transnational groupings and local groupings. So absolutely, if you're going to impose a uh, general prohibition on a particular item, it's going to have a particular effect. Nowhere in the world has a ban ever worked. It's never worked. I, I know of no example over the, you know, in modern times where a ban of anything has um, had the desired effect or stated desired effect that uh, you know government may have had in mind. I do know of many examples where regulatory or, or, or control mechanisms were, were implemented by government and that certainly had a market um, positive effect on whatever government was trying to do. Good examples would be uh, alternative um, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, to replace the addiction to heroin, for instance, in some European countries. And at the same time, one of the big problems was the sharing of needles because heroin's often consumed um, intravenously. And these were being administered by qualified uh, medical trained people at, at clinics funded by government. So on the one end, they, you know, uh, dealt with the uh, HIV transmission and other transmissions and so on um, and reduced that significantly but at the same time they were also able to monitor um, and, 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 and regulate those people that were addicted to, to heroin. It's not a it's not a hundred percent solve at all but you know we're living in modern times we're living in unprecedented times and I think we need to we need to be more creative. Uh, we cannot manage by decree, uh, you know, by simply banning something. There will be a consequence, and we're seeing that consequence now. David Shapiro, I'm sure you've got a question or two for Johan. Um, my view on this, Johan, or, or it reminds me of big corporations that issue memos and expect that their staff have all read the memos, and we know that nobody's read the memos, but it's a, a very blunt tool. Dave, uh, what's your take on all of this? 
I, you know, my, my overall concern are the companies that are going to be affected by this. South Africa is a tobacco growing country, or I assume it is. Um, if not, it's, it's certainly on our borders. And uh, in the same way, the ban on liquor, I mean, the whole of the Cape, uh, I don't say survives on it, but it's a very big uh, liquor producer in the sense of wines. And my big concern is that, you know, this is South African industry that we're killing ourselves. Um, I don't know how it affects the exports, whether they can still ex you know, export. But I mean, um, by allowing or entrenching other forces to come in, uh, you basically you're basically breaking up your own industry. You're breaking up your own economy in favor of others. Um, you have, what, 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 what kind of numbers do you have on the liquor side as well? Uh, you know, if there's seven and a half million smokers, how many people are consuming wine <laughs> or, or other oh, forms many. of drink? Mm. <laughs> and, 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 well, and, and, well, and many. the question is, does this, you know, you mentioned alternatives. If we're going to stop liquor, if we're going to stop cigarettes, does this help the the other trade? You know, the other substances, whether it's cocaine, uh, marijuana, um, other places like this. Does it? Do you see a spike up in that area? Okay, you ask me a lot of things now. I I, I think let me first just say to to, to be fair. I think government um, has good intention. Um, so they, they, they implement these uh, bans by decree um, and, and the stated intent is good. When it comes to exports, both uh, tobacco manufacturers and the, the um, uh, uh, wine and, 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 and beer and, and other forms of um, alcoholic beverages that I can't think of now, spirits, that's the other one, <laughs> um, they are allowed to export currently under lockdown. So um, at least government's given them that um, uh, midway out. Um, part of the problem is that a lot of those exported products end up back into the market because they've been just round tripped or ghost exported or whatever the case might be. And that in turn then feeds the illicit economy. Just and, explain uh, ghost export, please, because we've, and I know Rob wrote about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, that we've seen a surge in ghost exports of cigarettes, for instance. Yes. So you will uh, know, Alec, that um, uh, sort of two months into the lockdown, uh, government conceded that the regulations did not pr uh, prohibit the manufacturing for export uh, of cigarettes. And so um, all of the, the local tobacco manufacturers opened up again and started manufacturing their product for the export market. Now, the bulk of our South African manufacturers actually export to our neighboring states. Um, and I think it's only British American Tobacco and Goldleaf Tobacco Corporation that also have uh, uh, manufacturing plants in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and some of our neighboring states in Southern Africa. So a ghost export uh, and, and, and its cousin, uh, Round Trip, is effectively the same scheme. It purports to um, uh, send locally manufactured cigarettes to a, let's say, bordering state to Botswana or Zimbabwe or even further afield. Um, and then either it never leaves the shores or never crosses the border. In fact, it's an empty container, or in some cases, just the paperwork that's being done. Or its more complicated cousin would be it actually leaves the country, but then it gets smuggled straight back into the market for local consumption. The net effect of that when it comes to cigarettes, and the same, same applies to alcohol, is that because it, these, these products attract high levels of excise tax, in the case of a packet of cigarettes, it's close to 20 rand a packet of cigarettes. That's not paid because these goods are supposedly exported for foreign consumption. And that's then where the profit margin lies. So on a packet of cigarettes, these crooks make around 17 rand 50 a packet. What would they in a legal scenario be making per packet? It depends. You have, uh, um, you have what they call cheapies, which sell uh, in, in the sort of 20 to 25, uh, close to 30 rand um, 
uh, per packet, of which 17 rand 50 is, is, is excise, and around 2 rand to 3 rand is the cost to manufacture the pack. And then you get the, the more expensive brands, the more well-known uh, multinational types, some of them uh, that uh, retail up to in the 40s, 43 to 45 rand a packet. So that's more or less what you're looking at. So when you say people are paying up to five times the value of a packet of cigarettes, that's the five times value that they're paying. Azim Karim was a, and a self-confessed former smuggler. He said that it was quite easy. They worked with a guy called John Bredenkamp, who, the late John Bredenkamp, and who had a manufacturing uh, a factory in Azim. You know all these people intimately, uh, but they would just uh, use their, as he said, connections at the border post at Bart Bridge, and they'd come through into the into the country and be sold into the market, and no customers were paid. But all of this seems so obvious it seems so logical that there has to be in most rational beings minds something more to this surely we don't have a government that thinks it can by edict uh, have bans that people are going to adhere to when we do know from all evidence that is available that the, the underworld is is thriving why would this be? Do you, as a as an expert in this field, having seen all of this, do you put it down to my my question, which which I asked many people during the lockdown, is is it due to incompetence, or is it because those involved are corrupt, or are they captured? I, you know, Alec, I'm very, I, 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 I I'm hesitant to speculate. I'm. If, if you force me to, I would say that it's probably a combination of naivety. You know, it's your example of um, let's send the email to all the staff in the, in the big corporation and then they'll all comply. Uh, I think there's uh, an element of not understanding the illicit trade um, and, and the effects of, you know, banning something under conditions like this or even banning things under normal conditions. And then um, thirdly, I think it's, a, you know, there's a level of arrogance there because there's absolutely no attempt to find the midway in the way in which you've seen with the taxi industry, for instance, or with the spaza shops. There's just no engagement. It's all litigious from the word go. Now, I don't know what the solution is. The solution may well ultimately be that uh, cigarettes sales ought to be banned. But uh, you know why not ban smoking then, for that matter? Why ban the sale? So I think it's a combination of those sort of factors, and um, you know it's it's it, 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 it's it's as confusing to me as it is to to many other people. Um, smoking is bad for you. Drinking alcohol is bad for you if you drink too much, I believe, um, and. We understand the hospitals are full on weekends because people misbehave and South Africa does have a bad reputation when it comes to alcohol. But there's something in between banning and you know just free for all. I do believe there's something in between. But in order to find that, you're going to have to get all the different role players around the table. And that's missing for me. And what's also missing for me is the explanation explanations and that's why you're asking me to you know speculate i just honestly don't know it doesn't make sense i've seen no evidence that money goes to politicians i've seen no evidence that government benefits in fact government does not benefit government does not benefit because it holds a significant stake in one of our local tobacco manufacturers the big one through the pic so they're not benefiting from that they're also not benefiting from the excise taxes, and they're also not benefiting because the crooks are getting richer. So, you know, there's, it's 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 a complete, you know, in in game theory, there's no zero sum yet. It's um, it's a it's 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 yeah. I, I mean, I just don't know what else to say. If I have to speculate, it's um, I must just shake my head. Don't get it. <laughs> 
as we all do, but it is a democracy and everyone's got to vote and we're going to be able to vote in two years time. It'll be interesting to see where the South Africans do hold the government to account at that point in our Actually, history. Just to remind you, Alec, um, Mr. Mr. Brent Kamp's Masters International was shut down by us as part of Project Honey Badger, and Mr. Azim Karim perhaps forgot to tell you that. We also shut down their little operation called Delta Tobacco, which he perhaps neglected to, or there wasn't time to reflect on that. And then we were well on our way to shut down a few others too, if state capture didn't happen at the revenue service. So. Johan, uh, you're a hero to many of us, and uh, I think it's many, many people's wish that you could get involved again. All of those who were who were illegally and uh, victimized by the state capture project. It it, it just seems that's another uh, big question mark that that hangs in the in the minds of many rational South Africans. If these are the people who were prepared to stand up against state capture, why are they not brought back in now that state capture is apparently being shown the door? So. Uh, thank you for reminding us about that, Johan, and uh, I have no doubt that uh, God's in his heaven and uh, these things do tend to have a way of working working out uh, in, in the right way in the long term. But thanks again for your contribution to us here on, on uh, Rational Radio and indeed uh, for the way you've always shared your insights on Biz News uh, as a whole. David Shapiro, just to close off today, we've had a fascinating conversation, uh, as we always do. Uh, but particularly interesting today with the independent uh, thinkers that we had giving us insights. Uh, lovely to hear from Rob Rose at Financial Mail and uh, Johan, of course, uh, who is... Uh, I see. Um, uh, <laughs> well, there we go. He's all, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's user error on this side. I'm still not quite 100% uh, um, right with this, but we are getting better. But uh, again, a, a fascinating uh, program, Dave. And and Rob Rose as well. I mean, uh, the number of people, that's a, that's a massive issue as well. Uh, the number of kids that are not being fed, you know, without any responsibility. And, it, you know, just a point, I mean, in any other country, if the education minister would come under huge pressure by voters where, so, you know, so many kids are not getting their daily food, and yet with us it just bypasses government and uh, we move on to the next chapter without any accountability or repercussions or even answer. For me, that's, you know, that, that for, for poor little kids, for people in poverty who've been denied food, uh, to me is a, is a, is a bigger, as big an issue as the, uh, as the tobacco and drinking issue is as well. Very, very big. It's well denied and they go to court to defend that action. It's, mm. it's almost it's bizarre. In the, mm. <coughs> Anyway, Absolutely but <laughs> well, we live in an amazing country and uh, we learn every day and we're a young democracy. I guess it's the best you can say about it. And hopefully we learn um, as a democracy from the lessons that we are being taught all the time about power corrupting and absolute power corrupting. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Alec Hogg. It's been my pleasure to be your host on Rational Radio. It's um, always, we're always here every Monday for Biz News Premium subscribers. And don't forget our flagship uh, webinar on a Thursday, uh, which is the Noontime Thursday webinar. We've been talking to founders of uh, South African iconic companies, and we'll have another group for you coming up this week. Until next Monday, though, uh, from myself, David Shapiro, Stuart Lohman, and the team, uh, I'll say goodbye. Stuart can just uh, tell you how you can get hold of a copy of a recording of this webinar if you had to pop out at any stage. Stuart? Excellent, thanks, Alec, and thanks to all the guests. This was enlightening, so fascinating. Um, I've just put the YouTube channel on the chat bar on the control panel. If you click on there, you can subscribe and you'll get the automatic feed, or you can wait for this one to be uploaded, which will hopefully be in the next hour or two. So thanks again, everyone, for your time. Have a good day.